like to call the meeting to order and welcome everyone in attendance. The committee has under consideration the estimates of the Ministry of Environment and Parks for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2023. I'd ask that we go around the table and have members introduce themselves for the record. Minister, when we get to you, please introduce the officials who are joining you at the table. My name is David Hansen. I'm the MLA for Bonneville Cold Lake St. Paul and chair of the committee. We'll begin starting on my right. Shane Getson, MLA for Laxon and Parkland. Pete Guthrie, Erdrick Cochran. Tracy Allard, Grand Prairie. Tanny Al, Fort McMurray Wood Buffalo. Good morning, Cyril Turton, Spruce Grove, Stony Plain. Good morning, everyone. Peter Singh, MLA, Calgary East. Pat Rain, MLA, Lesser Slave Lake. Jason Nixon, MLA for Rimby, Rocky Mountain House Sundry and the Minister of Environment and Parks. On my right is Deputy Minister uh, Bevy, who's the Deputy Minister of Environment and Parks. To her right is Tom Davis, who's the Assistant Deputy Minister of Resource Stewardship. On my left is Kate Rich, who's the Assistant Deputy Minister of Policy. And Daryl Dancaus, who's the Assistant Minister, Deputy Minister of Financial Services and the Senior Financial Officer at Environment and Parks. Kathleen Ganley, MLA Calgary Mountain View. Marlon Schmidt, Edmonton Gold Bar. Uh, Warren Huffman, Committee Clerk. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'd like to note the following substitutions for the record. MLA Allard for MLA Lovely. A few housekeeping items to address before we turn to the business at hand. Please note that the microphones are operated by Hansard staff. <clears throat> Committee proceedings are being live streamed on the internet and broadcast on Alberta Assembly TV. The audio and video stream and transcripts of meetings can be accessed via the Legislative Assembly website. Members participating remotely are encouraged to have your camera on while speaking and your microphone muted when not speaking. Remote participants who wish to be placed on a speaker's list are asked to email or send a message in the group chat to the committee clerk and members in the room are asked to please signal the chair. Please set your cell phones and other devices to silent for the duration of the meeting. Honourable members, the standing orders set out the process for consideration of the main estimates. A total of three hours has been scheduled for consideration of the estimates for the Ministry of Environment and Parks. Standing Order 59.01-6 establishes the speaking rotation and speaking times. In brief, the Minister or member of the Executive Council acting on the Minister's behalf will have 10 minutes to address the Committee. At the conclusion of the Minister's comments, a 60-minute speaking block for the official opposition begins, followed by a 20-minute speaking block for independent members, if any, and then a 20-minute speaking block for the Government Caucus. Individuals may only speak for up to 10 minutes at a time, but time may be combined with the member and the Minister. After this rotation of speaking time, we'll then follow the same rotation of the official opposition, independent members and Government Caucus. The member and the Minister may each speak once for a maximum of 5 minutes, or these times may be combined, making it a 10-minute block. <clears throat> if members have any questions regarding Speaking times or, or the rotation, please feel free to send an email or message the committee clerk about the process. With the concurrence of the committee, I will call a five-minute break near the midpoint of the meeting. However, the three-hour clock will continue to run. Does anyone oppose taking a break? Seeing none, we will announce that at the time. Ministry officials may be present and at the direction of the minister may address the committee. Ministry officials seated at, in the gallery, if called upon, have access to a microphone in the gallery area and are asked to please introduce themselves for the record prior to commenting. Pages are available to deliver notes or other materials between the gallery and the table. Attendees in the gallery may not approach the table. Space permitting, opposition caucus staff may sit at the table to assist their members. However, members have priority to sit at the table at all times. If debate is exhausted prior to three hours, the ministry's estimates are deemed to have been considered for the time allotted in the schedule and the committee will adjourn. Points of order will be dealt with as they arise, and individual speaking times will be paused. However, the speaking block time and the overall three-hour meeting clock will continue to run. Any written material provided in response to questions raised during the main estimate should be tabled by the Minister in the Assembly for the benefit of all members. The vote on the estimates and any amendments will occur in Committee of Supply on March 21, 2022. Amendments must be in writing and approved by a Parliamentary Council prior to the meeting at which they are to be moved. The original amendment is to be deposited with the committee clerk with 20 hard copies. An electronic version of the signed original should be provided to the committee clerk for distribution to committee members. Finally, the committee should have the opportunity to hear both questions and answers without interruption during estimate debate. Debate flows through the chair at all times, including instances when speaking time is shared between a member and the minister. I would now invite the Minister of Environment and Parks to begin with your opening remarks and you have 10 minutes, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you to your committee for the time today. I'm excited to be here to present uh, Alberta Environment and Parks 2022 estimates. 
Uh, with this budget, Alberta Environment Parks is focused on supporting a strong economic recovery and a strong financial future for our province. Our budget makes important investments in species and habitat conservation, new capital investments on public land, including trail maintenance, as well as climate initiatives that are supporting innovation, jobs and economic growth. The Ministry's 2022-23 operating expenses is $534 million, which reflects an increase of $35 million or 7% over budget 2021-22. I'll go into a bit more detail about some of our main priorities for the coming year. Mr. Chair, Albertans really enjoy fishing, but it's important to have a healthy aquatic population to support this recreation sport. That's why Budget 22-23 includes more funding to support the recovery of Alberta's native trout and capital investments in our fish stocking hatcheries. $600,000 will support native trout habitat remediation and restoration, while $6.9 million is dedicated for the Coal Lake fish hatchery upgrades to support design and construction of new recirculating uh, aquaculture systems that will help protect against whirling disease. An additional $21.7 million is being provided for the Raven Creek Brood Trout Station to support a new brood brooding facility with three separate brood rooms, a production floor and staff residence to provide on-site emergency response due to the remoteness of this facility. Mr. Chair, these investments will ensure Alberta has a healthy fish population and aquatic habitat for years to come. As well, Mr. Chair, Alberta is also making a great progress on lowering emissions and Budget 2022 continues this important work. Budget 2022 maintains our commitment to the Technology Innovation and Emissions Reduction Program or the TIER Fund. And as you know, Mr. Chair, our TIER system is best suited to Alberta's unique economy and, and needs and covers about 60% of the provincial emissions. Budget 2022 includes $698 million of TIER funding over three years for projects and programs that will support jobs reduce emissions and help Albertans adapt to changing climate. Tier fund revenue estimates increased from the 2021-22 budget to the 2022-23 estimates. With this increase, more funding will be allocated for programs supporting technology and innovation and emission reductions, including funding for the Municipal Climate Change Action Centre and Emissions Reductions Alberta. Government funded agencies like Emissions Reductions Alberta are helping move Alberta's recovery plan forward. And tier funding projects are creating jobs, attracting investment and reducing emissions. Just 10 days ago, I was pleased to announce up to $12 million from the TIER Fund will go towards energy efficiency projects for small to medium oil and gas producers. This program will help these operators invest in cost-effective emission reduction technologies. It's part of ERA's $55 million energy savings for business program, which is expected to cut 1.1 million tonnes of emissions, create about 1,400 jobs and stimulate 300 million in economic activity. Mr. Chair, it's projects like these that are making real differences in emission management. We're proud of the work that ERA is doing with the department. In fact, since they were created in 2009, $796 million for carbon price revenue has been reinvested into 220 projects worth $6.5 billion and will cut an expected 42 million tonnes of GHG emissions by 2030. Alberta has seen a fantastic response to these funding programs, demonstrating that our industries are eager to reduce emissions and get Alberta's economy back on track. Environment Parks is also responsible for a variety of environmental monitoring activities, and Budget 2022 continues this important work. Mr. Chair, as you know, the actual amount spent for the oil sands monitoring depends on the work plans approved by the Oil Sands Monitoring Program Oversight Committee, which is made up of federal and provincial and gov government representatives, as well as industry and area Indigenous communities. We expect that the Oversight Committee will be releasing their monitoring plan for this year very soon. We're committed to ensuring our oil sands monitoring budget for 2022 remains consistent this year. And we will continue to invest up to $50 million annually in oil sands monitoring going forward. Mr. Chair, I'm also pleased to inform the committee that funding is maintained in Budget 2022 for other science and environmental monitoring. This funding helps ensure strong water and air monitoring across our province. When it comes to water monitoring, funding will, be, will support our 115 water quality monitoring stations, at rivers and tributaries across Alberta, plus an additional 31 tributary sites in the oil sands region. Funding also supports important work on water quality management frameworks, including new plans for the North Saskatchewan and Upper Athabasca and Battle Rivers. Budget 2022 also supports important work with airshed groups to support air quality monitoring across the province. And overall funding supports grants for community airsheds, monitoring equipment, and maintenance to air monitoring stations. Sorry about that. Thank you. Alberta Environment Parks is also continuing its work to modernize our regulatory system. Our new system is making the review of applications more transparent and efficient, 
all while maintaining high environmental standards. $19 million is being provided over the next three years for continued work on the Digital Regulatory Assurance System, or DRAS. DRAS makes regulatory applications for non-energy development activities like fertilizer, water use, and livestock grazing available online. This new system address what, addresses what we have heard from the industry, stakeholders, and citizens. Alberta's environmental regulatory system is outdated, complex, and difficult to navigate. This transformation is about improving operational efficiencies while maintaining the environmental protections that Albertans demand. DRAS started rolling out in 2021 and expected to be complete in 2023 as all application types move online. Following the launch of DRAS, the average timeline to issue a decision on a Water Act application is 59 days from submission. Previously, it was 155 days. This, Mr. Chair, represents approximately a 60% decrease in the average decision time. And applications are finding, uh, applicants, I should say, Mr. Chair, are finding it better too, saving an estimated 44 days throughout the application process. While Budget 2022 helps enhance our regulatory system, it's also improving experiences for Albertans in our parks and our public lands. More Albertans than ever before are exploring our great province and experiencing all that our provincial parks and public lands have to offer. In Kananaskis country, we welcomed more than 5 million visitors last year, and the Kananaskis Conservation Pass is providing services and supporting operations to offer premier recreation experiences in Alberta's Rocky Mountains. To date, the Kananaskis Pass Conservation Pass, I should say, has generated 12 million in revenue, which funds supporting premier recreation experiences in that region. In fact, just last week, the Premier and I were in Canmore to announce $17.5 million over the next two years as part of this budget to support upgrades to the Canmore Nordic Centre. These upgrades will, upgrades will create 90 jobs and help support the Centre's world-class reputation as a Premier Nordic sports facility. Projects like this, Mr. Chair, are possible because of the Kananaskis Conservation Pass. Kananaskis Pass revenues are being reinvested to support visitor information centres, groom trails, hire staff and conservation officers, support public safety and better connect Albertans to nature. For instance, we have spent half a million dollars to reopen and staff visitor centres, four million dollars to address increased operating costs due to the surge in demand, including search and rescue, trail grooming and traffic control. Five million dollars to support the hiring of new staff, including 20 new conservation officers and 20 new land officers. I'm pleased to share that tomorrow I'll be taking part in the graduation ceremony for 19 new conservation officers, many of whom will be stationed in the Kananaskis region, fulfilling our commitment for more boots on the ground. We'll provide an update soon on additional investments and projects that the past is supporting, including some exciting municipal and community association partnerships. Outside of Kananaskis, we know that Alberta is blessed with a strong trail network. Trails are an important part of Alberta's history and identity and offer Albertans and visitors an opportunity to experience the outdoors while contributing to conservation, tourism and well-being. Budget 2022 allows for important trail maintenance and conservation work like repairing trail water crossings so we can support healthy fish and other aquatic life habitats. And it will support a bigger role for partnerships in maintaining trails as outlined in the recently passed Trails Act. Speaking of the great outdoors, Mr. Chair, we're expecting another busy camping season this summer. The park's operating system budget is increasing by 15% this year due to an expected increase in camping occupancy. With more Albertans than ever before seeking to get outside and explore our provincial parks, it's important we do what we can to promote fair and equal access to campsites while continuing to prioritize affordability. That's why we are increasing the reservation charge fee from $5 to $10 to address overbooking and recover the costs of no-shows and last-minute cancellations. Mr. Chair, I've already spoken about the Canmore Nordic Centre as well, but we're also pleased that the infra infrastructure projects like the William Watson Lodge will reopen again this summer, providing Albertans with disabilities an opportunity to enjoy our parks. As Alberta starts booking camping spots this spring, we can't lose sight of another annual spring event, flooding. Flooding has disrupted the lives of Albertans and our economy too often in recent years. Budget 2022 includes $27.7 million for 11 flood mitigation capital grants in flood-prone communities around the province. $5.2 million, for example, this year for the Horsefly Emergency Spillway in the MD of Tabor, and $12.3 million for the Upper Plateau Separation Project in Calgary. Budget 2022 also includes funding for new and updated flood maps so we can help support safe and resilient communities. Mr. Chair, I'm pleased to say that since 2020, Alberta has delivered more than 1,500 kilometres of new or updated draft flood mapping to Albertans, which is more than the previous 30 years combined. Mr. Chairman, Environment Parks will continue its important work to improve environmental oversight and protect Alberta's parks and public lands. Budget 2022 will help us carry out this important work for the benefit of Albertans now and for future generations. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'll be happy to take some questions. Thank you, Minister. For the hour that follows, members of the official opposition and the Minister may speak 
Honourable members, you will be able to see the timer for speaking block on the two clocks up above and in the committee, and in the committee room and on, also on Microsoft Teams on the big screens. Members, would you like to combine your time with the Minister? Yes, please. The Minister, are you amenable to that? Yep. Okay, we will go back and forth, so you may begin, Mr. Schmidt. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the Minister and everyone from the Department for showing up and agreeing to share time. I think I appreciate the opportunity to have, a, have a, a, an open back and forth to talk about the, the budget for the Environment uh, Ministry. And, and Minister, it sounds like you're feeling a little bit under the weather today. I hope you get well soon. Um, I, my, my first question is about uh, page 45 uh, of the Environment and Parks Business Plan. Uh, the, the science and monitoring uh, line item in the business plan, you talked about that off the top, that the government is committed to spending uh, the, the, the required amount on oil sands monitoring of approximately $50 million. So we see that in the 2022-23 estimate, but in the 23-24 target and the 24-25 target, we see only $47.9 million uh, budgeted. So I'm just curious if the minister can inform the committee uh, what the plan is for uh, science and monitoring and, and why it doesn't even meet that $50 million threshold uh, that you committed to delivering uh, this year. So, Mr. Chair, the, uh, the amount of money that goes into the oil sands monitoring program uh, of $50 million is established through multiple agreements. Uh, it's important to note that that organization uh, is made up of uh, several groups, including Environment Canada, Alberta Environment Parks, as the Honourable Member knows, as well as uh, quite a list of First Nation communities in the area that are part of that organization. Uh, the $50 million is set outside of government, uh, and it does not come from general revenue. It's through uh, payments from the industry. Uh, Environment and Parks is moving towards, uh, at the request of uh, people involved in the committee, uh, with, along with the federal government, towards a uh, financial administrator for portions of uh, that budget. Uh, in an outlining years, it's anticipated that uh, $20 million of the oil sands monitoring program would be within that financial administrator, uh, but would continue to be used for oil sands monitoring and not within Alberta Environment and Parks uh, budget. There's a couple reasons why uh, that has been asked for by people that are involved. Uh, first is just from a good accounting perspective, the reality is that this is not Alberta Environment Parks money, it comes through a different uh, source. Uh, and second uh, was for efficiencies uh, for that oil sands monitoring group uh, as they put in their work plans for the year that they don't find themselves uh, always encumbered by uh, Alberta government budget practices and are able to uh, be able to move uh, their financial resources uh, forward uh, in, a, uh, in a more effective way. To be very clear though, Mr. Chair, it would still remain $50 million. Uh, and they would, the process would remain the same. You have to file a, an operating plan that would be agreed to, uh, including with Environment Canada and Alberta Environment Parks, as well as with all of the industry partners, the First Nation partners that make up the oil sands monitoring group. So uh, I, I appreciate that explanation. Can you help the committee, on, can the minister help the committee understand exactly how, the, how this is achieved and, and why it doesn't show up on the books? I, I mean, I know that this is an incredibly a nerdy question, but we have consolidated budgeting. Why would $20 million that is spent on uh, oil sands monitoring delivered uh, by the oil sands monitoring group not show up on our books? So w it help it, to recap, I guess if you could help the committee understand how this is more efficient than the current system and then why that money won't show up on the books in the future. Uh, again, it's a uh, part of it will show up on the books, the part that's associated with Alberta Environment and Parks, uh, but industry money that is not associated with Alberta Environment and Parks would be run through the administration authority. We already do this for Caribou. Uh, we have found it to be more efficient and able to get resources to the environmental need. Uh, and the reason that uh, there, it's not more detailed to be spoken about at the moment uh, is because we're going through a process to make sure that that could be done right. Uh, and working, and that, that involves, of course, the Auditor General and other uh, organizations like Treasury Board and Finance uh, to make sure that that structure would be uh, appropriate. Uh, and we'll have more to say about that as we progress with that conversation. What's important, though, uh, Mr. Chair, is that the $50 million will remain, uh, whether it's with the current format that we utilize now or with a future partnership with an administrative authority. So can, can, can the Minister tell the committee why why the number $20 million is being moved to a financial administrator and, and not the whole $50 million? Uh, why are we splitting this 
uh, uh, amount? And, and how did $20 million end up being the amount that we decided to put into a financial administrator? So the portion uh, that would remain in the budget is for the monitoring that the Department of Alberta Environment conducts uh, and this taxpayer resources that are invested in the oil sands monitoring program uh, and is managed by Alberta Environment Parks. The $20 million uh, would be for the portion that we do not uh, conduct and is conducted by uh, other agencies that are involved in the oil sands monitoring program. So will that change how the, the oil sands monitoring programs are, 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 are funded? Like, help, help me on, because it, it Help, help me understand if my current understanding is correct. All of the $50 million is put into the oil sands monitoring program every year. The oversight committee approves the general monitoring plan and then it's funded directly. Uh, are, are they going to have to now separate the uh, different monitoring programs and say, well, this one is conducted by industry, so it comes from this pot of money and this, this one is funded by Alberta Environment, and so this comes from this pot of money. and. Uh, and if that's the case, how are we going to continue to maintain an integrated oil sands monitoring system? So it, it does not change how the oil sands monitoring program is funded. To be very clear, the oil sands monitoring program is funded by industry uh, to a tune of $50 million. Uh, the working plan and how that resource is used to monitor the oil sands is uh, created through the oil sands monitoring group, again, which is made up of Alberta Environment Parks, Environment Canada as well as industry partners uh, in the oil sands region and, uh, of course, indigenous communities. Um, the budget is based on, ultimately, the budget of how you spend is based on the Oversight Committee's recommendations, as Mr. Chair, the Honourable Member knows and just referred to. But the question that uh, I believe is being asked by the Honourable Member is whether it would change how much has to be paid for by industry, whether industry would be the continue to be the only funder of uh, the oil sands monitoring program, going forward and whether or not the Oversight Committee would change how they determine how oil sands monitoring takes place. And the answer to that question is nothing uh, would change as far as that structure. What would be in Alberta Environment and Parks budget is the amount of money that we expense uh, in the department in a year for oil sands monitoring that is paid for by industry through that program. Uh, and the amount of money that we do not expense that goes out to uh, other partners within the oil sands monitoring process through the same work plan uh, would no longer be in Alberta Environment and Parks books. So, if, if I understand correctly, then $20 million is being, uh, every year in oil sands monitoring is being moved off the books, which means that in the 23, 24, and 24, 25 targets, we've got effectively a, approximately $30 million set aside for oil sands monitoring that's showing up there, and then another $18 million for other environmental science monitoring evaluation and reporting functions. Is that correct? Which, just to make sure we're on the same line item. Yeah, so um, page 45, I'm still looking at the statement of operations. So we've got science and monitoring in 23-24, for approximately $48 million. Now, if, if you're moving $20 million of oil sands monitoring money off the books, that means that $30 million of oil sands monitoring is showing up in this line item. Is that correct? Yes. And then the remainder would be dedicated, I assume, would be dedicated to other environmental science monitoring, evaluation, and, and reporting functions. Uh, is that, is my understanding correct? I'm going to get you to repeat, Mr. Chair, can I get the envelope just to repeat the end part of that to make sure I'm answering this question? I didn't quite catch it. Sure. So, it, in the 23 24 target year and 24 25 target years, we're looking at approximately 17.9, maybe $18 million in other environmental science and monitoring money. Is, is that correct? So I, I think the question the Honourable Member is asking is if there's $30 million uh, that still remain for the oil sands monitoring program in that line item, whether or not the difference uh, would still be going towards other monitoring in the province, and the answer to that question is yes. Thank, yeah. thank you for clarifying my understanding. So in the 22-23 estimates on page 92, we see that the allocated amount for environmental science monitoring, evaluation, and reporting is, is $20 million. So are we looking at a $2 million cut to, the, the, uh, to line item 9.1 then in the 23-24 uh, uh, and 24-25 targets?
Um, just to be clear, you're referring to 9.1, uh, correct number? Yes, that's, that's correct. Um, uh, the way I have it uh, currently in front of me in the estimates, I, I'm not sure where you're coming up with the number from, but uh, I have it as fairly stable, um, um, the environmental science monitoring process, where the number is staying pretty much similar. Oh, well, uh, I, I suppose that's what we that. call in the legislature a, a matter of debate. Maybe one person would see $18 million as being close enough to $20 million, but maybe other people would say, well, a $2 million reduction in the out years uh, might have a significant negative impact on our environmental science monitoring and, and reporting functions. So can, can the minister inform the committee what the plan is for maintaining uh, our environmental science monitoring and uh, reporting functions in the face of what appears to be a $2 million cut to that budget? In, the, in this year's budget, there's uh, $20 million to be going to science and monitoring. Uh, in outer year budgets, uh, the process obviously uh, would be evaluated as we get closer to other uh, budgets. There's our multiple monitoring groups that we work with uh, that would help determine all the budgets. What I can say, though, is that science and monitoring budget's going to remain very stable between 18 and $20 million uh, going forward in the outlining years and as a priority for the department. I don't have the breakdown of uh, further out years. Uh, that would have to be developed as we prepare the following budgets. But what this budget shows is a, an ongoing commitment to science and monitoring. Well, to, to, to be fair to, the, to members of the committee, we could be looking at the same amount of money or a 10% cut to the, to the budget. And, and those two things are significantly different, and I'm afraid that we might have uh, some problems meeting our uh, environmental obligations given such a massive cut proposed to the environmental science and monitoring and reporting budget in the out years. Now, uh, I want to look now at page 95 of the estimates. We talked a little bit, or the minister talked a little bit about um, fees that were collected this year, and, and the minister uh, has introduced a number of new fees uh, for parks. So uh, can, the, can the minister confirm my understanding? It's been reported in the media that uh, the amount of the Kananaskis Conservation Pass uh, is expected to be approximately $15 million this year. Is that, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Can the minister help the committee understand where in, in those, in the line items in the government expenses on pages 91, 92, or 93, uh, where that $15 million is showing up? Line 7-1. It's, it's just in line 7-1. Correct. Okay. So can the minister explain to the committee why uh, the amount forecast for 21-22 is approximately $53 million, and yet the 22-23 estimate is $49 million, a $4 million reduction, even though the Kananaskis country is expected to generate 3 to $4 million more this year than it generated last year? Uh, that, that number is based on occupancy projections. Uh, and part of the challenges from the provincial parks perspective of uh, being able to predict occupancy in the this year and outlining years as uh, the impact of as we come out of COVID is going to change some of the numbers that we've seen inside our campground systems. If you like, I'm happy to bring the Assistant Deputy Minister of Provincial Parks up to have a conversation with you on how they determine occupancy estimates. But at the end of the day, that number is tied directly to occupancy inside campgrounds and people that are utilizing uh, can ask us. So sorry, the, the, the line 7.1, the $49 million that, that appears there is, is generated based on projected occupancy for this year? Is that, is that correct? A tremendous amount of it, yes. Okay, so uh, I, I mean, in 2020, we saw a record number of visitors to Kananaskis country. 2021, we saw a 10% reduction in the number of visitors. Um, perhaps the, the K country fee was a disincentive for people to visit the park. But, but how, help, help me understand, are, are we seeing a 10% reduction in estimated visitors uh, to parks this year? Or what, like why are we seeing this $4 million drop? The park fees are dedicated revenue. And so if the department is slightly off on their projections, uh, they will uh, have to uh, reinvest fees inside the area. And you can see, I'll, look, I'll point you to the last budget forecast. You can see it was budgeted, I believe, at 
43 million on that line item I ended up coming in if I got this right at 53 million I'll yeah. double check with with officials yeah. uh, which shows uh, that that increase uh, in occupancy resulted in an increase in revenue uh, which of course results in an increase in expense to be able to maintain the park system again mr. chair if the honorable member is very interested in how parks determines uh, occupancy rates happy to bring the assistant deputy minister up to the microphone to talk to him about that in detail Minister, I, I, I guess my, my my primary concern here is that at, we just confirmed that we are going to generate approximately $15 million in Kananaskis country fees this year. The, the Minister has confirmed that. Uh, we, it, 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 I'm still waiting for an adequate explanation. We only see a $6 million increase over the 21-22 budget in parks operations, even though we're projecting a $15 million increase in revenue. Yes already added previously uh, in the previous years, uh, previous years, sorry. Um, and again, the Canas Conservation Pass, uh, it goes to making sure that we can adequately uh, pay for Kananaskis. And one of the big changes uh, moving forward with the Canas Conservation Pass is campgrounds and all of my colleagues' ridings across the province, uh, not having to pay the bill just for Kananaskis going forward, which allows um, the fee to be able to go pay for the utilization of our busiest park, uh, but money to be reinvested uh, across uh, uh, the province uh, from people that are using it. Uh, Mr. Chair, you and I both know and have talked about this many times in your community where there are many provincial parks, especially in your Great Lake communities, uh, who have had to disproportionately subsidize Kananaskis until that fee had come in, into place. So again, the, we are spending more than the $15 million from the Kananaskis conservation uh, fee on Kananaskis and will continue to. Uh, and you can find it in that line item. Uh, you are correct. There may be some adjustments if we have a busier year. Some years we have a less busy year. And so the department has to make a prediction. Uh, but fees, so uh, like the Kananaskis conservation fee, have to be reinvested back into Kananaskis. Um, and that's where it'll go. No, fine. Oh. Okay, I... It, it, it is an interesting budget, I guess, where you're projecting $15 million in dedicated revenue, but only a $6 million increase in, in the expenses. Uh, but Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll actually ask the Assistant Deputy Minister of Parks to come up okay, um, and have Thank a conversation you. about how the department determines occupancy rates. Uh, he'll probably elaborate a little bit more on uh, how some of the renovations he's doing across the, uh, the province, but if you'd like to hear more detail on that, come on up, uh, ADM Schreiter. I Assistant Deputy Minister uh, Shane Schreiber, responsible for parks operations. Uh, so to, to uh, try and answer your question as best I can, uh, what that number is a combination of both the uh, conservation past revenue and also the likely revenue from camping fees and, and, and other fees. Uh, when we, we use a rolling five-year average to estimate the amount of generated revenue we're going to get from camping fees. Uh, and then we also uh, take a look at which uh, campgrounds may be closed for renovation uh, and try and estimate, uh, try and add that into the estimate so it's a little bit more accurate. Uh, and then the final thing we do is we err on the side of being conservative because uh, we, um, we may have bad weather, which means we'll have less revenue generated. And that's the number that we... That's how we come up with the number that's in there. Now, it's important for us to ask for less, and then if we generate more revenue, we can always go back and ask Treasury Board if we can keep that revenue and reinvest it back in the, uh, in the park system. So that's why that number seems to be less in the forecast or less in the budget, uh, but grows as we actually generate additional revenue. Uh, does that help explain it? Uh, I, I, I appreciate the explanation. I, I have certainly heard from many Albertans who are concerned that they that they aren't seeing necessarily the $15 million being spent in Kananaskis country. You know, we still have garbage cans that are overflowing, parking lots that are full to bursting, roads that are filled with potholes, uh, campgrounds that, uh, you know, are in, are in shape that uh, is, is disappointing to many of the people who, who visit the park. So... I, I, I appreciate the explanation of the process. What assurances can the department give to the people of Alberta that the money is being spent in Kananaskis and how will they know what it's being spent on other than, you know, the occasional government press release? 
Well, uh, Mr. Chair, first off, I was in Kananaskis the other day and I'm happy to report that basically everybody that we spoke to in Kananaskis uh, thanks us for bringing the Kananaskis conservation fee and some of the significant investments taking place. And I'll give a list of a bunch of it here in a second. Uh, the reality is that uh, this is a big provincial park and our entire provincial park system, uh, unfortunately, underneath the previous government was allowed to deteriorate uh, with almost no investment uh, inside it. And that's something that we are correcting right now. Um, I'll give you some figures right now. The Regional Transit Initiative with the Town of Canmore, a $1 million investment. Investing in local volunteer trail organizations, 550000 Supporting visitor service centres and information centres, a half a million dollars. The West Brad Creek Association, a quarter million dollars. The Moose Mountain Trail Bike Association, $100,000. The Friends of Kananaskis Country, $100,000. Camoran Area Mountain Bike Association, $100,000. Grooming of Winter Trails, a quarter million dollars. Operation of subsidizing facilities, including the Camor Nordic Centre, one million dollars. William Watson Lodge, three quarters of a million dollars. Planning for the infrastructure upgrades to Camor Nordic Centre, one million dollars. Running the Kananaskis Country Public Safety Program, one point five million dollars. Additional supports that we've just invested in search and rescue, $100,000. Contracting traffic management services, $350,000. And hiring new conservation officers, $5 million. Uh, and I will point out, Mr. Chair, something that you and I both know, our constituents have long asked for, was a strong investment in boots on the ground, and that's something that this budget has uh, and would not be made possible without an appropriate fee structure. Um, and, of course, just the other day, $17.5 million for the Canmore Nordic Centre. Uh, we cannot see the entire park system be repaired from the damage that was created by the NDP government uh, but in, in one year. But it will be and is now on a trajectory to make sure that that can be uh, accomplished. Um, they are, uh, the, the reality is that um, to leave a, a mountain park, uh, the only mountain park uh, that has no fee on it, uh, like that, will continue to see a spot where it will not be sustainable long term. 5.4 million people go to Canada. We're, we're in Kananaskis, I believe, last year. Uh, that is more than Banff. Uh, they, that is a park that has more search and rescue calls than all of the mountain parks in BC and Alberta combined. Uh, we have a brand new emergency services center there as well. Um, and the investments are going to continue uh, on long term. More, most importantly, though, uh, there will be an appropriate fee now with Kananaskis that allows there to be sustainability for that important park and stops, again, your constituents and my constituents' parks from having to pay uh, for Kananaskis. So, uh, th thank you very much for that explanation. Now, the minister mentioned a, a, a bunch of grants to a number of uh, trail organizations. Uh, sorry, just confirm from my understanding that that m money is coming from line 7.1 of the uh, government estimates, first of all. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Can the minister explain to the committee the, the process that uh, people have to go through to apply for these grants? Um, uh, what criteria uh, they have to meet? Um, how many pr applications were received? Uh, can, can, the, can the minister share with, uh, with the committee how that, how that granting program that, that the minister mentioned was structured? Um. If we want to have that level of conversation in detail, you uh, have to have a conversation both with the ADM and Public Lands and Parks, I think would be, cause, and then we may have slightly different processes for both. Again, Mr. Chair, happy to bring either of them up to the mic if that's what we like. Why don't we start with the ADM of Public Lands, Brian Makowecki. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Brian Makwecki, ADM of uh, Lands and Environment and Parks. Yeah, so uh, a lot of our folks work directly on the ground with people in these communities and uh, in local areas. That there's uh, uh, identified needs that come through time, uh, some long-standing opportunities and relationships in those areas, and and uh, the often the grants and discussions are happening with the most sophisticated and and uh, um, capable groups on the ground to de to deliver some of these uh, opportunities where we see. Uh, the need um, for investment. So it's there's it's a lot of it is is uh, worked with between our frontline people and and local groups. So I, I, I'm thinking of other grant programs that are operated regularly through the government of Alberta. Uh, CFEP is is one that I deal with uh, a lot in my constituency uh, office. You know, there's there's a, 
a, a well-defined process, there's a well-defined application form. Uh, where can Albertans find the application form for grants uh, for this, for these grants? Mr. Chair, I, so the difference between those programs, this is not a competitive process. This is about managing the landscape. Uh, and the Department of Public Lands, the Department of Parks, works with a variety of partners on a daily basis to be able to manage uh, that landscape. Uh, and as the Assistant Deputy Minister referred to, a, a tremendous amount of this is about existing relationships with ENGOs, nonprofit organizations, and others that are helping us uh, maintain our parks and public land system. Uh, well, I know. Uh, in the past, the, uh, the Honourable Member's government really did not want to work with those organizations. That's something that's a high priority for our government. Um, and so some of, a lot of this has to deal with need and the priority of need and which partner is in the best place uh, to be able to, uh, to help us accomplish those needs as they are uh, developed. So it, I, I guess can the, can the Minister help the committee understand how those needs are uh, evaluated? I mean, for any kind of grant program, we have presumably much more demand than there are resources available. There must be some kind of selection criteria for these grants. I, I appreciate the minister's comments that uh, these are built on uh, pre-existing relationships, but I guess what assurances can the people of Alberta be given that uh, these grants are handed out in a, in a fair and transparent manner? The, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, the Honourable Member is going to be a little bit more specific. The Department of Environment uh, works on trail maintenance from everything from bridges to hiking trails, cross-country ski trails, off-highway vehicle trails, uh, horseback riding, on and on and on. Um, if you would like to know how the public land employees and parks employees decide uh, each of those priorities, um, sure. you're going to need to ask a little bit more specific so, detail so I, than that. I, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Thank, I appreciate the minister's <clears throat> request for clarity, uh, and I apologize for not being clear. When the minister was detailing how the 15, or the revenue from the Kananaskis country fee was being administered, he mentioned a number of groups that had uh, received grants to do work in Kananaskis country. I, I, am, I guess I'm curious to know how the people of Alberta can be assured that these grants were assigned fairly uh, through an open and transparent process. I'll see if the ADM wants to supplement uh, the process that we use for grants for trail levels. Uh, go for it, uh, Brian. Yeah, so it, it really does come down to that on the ground knowledge. So who's on the ground a best place to deliver some of this work has been has been largely the way that we've uh, have moved forward this year. We do have, um, you know, we have ongoing discussions with some of the most significant uh, uh, groups in, in the province on a number of the different topics. Um, and we are working towards as we continue to move forward on things like the uh, the Trails Act and other pieces to uh, to, to to have systems in place where we can make sure that uh, uh, that we're able to communicate that well to the people and make sure that we're getting the uh, input from the broader group because part of it is going to be enabled through some of the recreation planning that's enabled under the Trails Act. So we will have, um, th that act allows us to uh, incorporate views of local people in, and industry, indigenous people, um, and it'll be more of a done through a planning process so that that is, uh, that's, that's the way we're gonna sort of identify those priorities and make sure that there's sustainability to trail development. So, so uh, you know, I'll, I'll show, oh, supplement that as well, uh, Mr. Chair, if I could. Uh, again, this is a large landscape uh, that the department is responsible for. Uh, identifying multiple priorities, and yes, the Honourable Member is correct, you can't solve every priority uh, in one uh, budget. Uh, and so those priorities are being identified through uh, the Department of Environment, particularly through public lands and parks, uh, and then it's through uh, existing relationships on the ground of which partner could be in the best spot to be able to help uh, accomplish that, conversations that are taking place um, with those partners. I mean, for example, if you're doing work inside Kananaskis, the Friends of Kananaskis are a common organization that works with the department on a regular basis uh, to be able to help uh, maintain that important park. And so that would be a logical partner that the department will talk to. But when a grant is given out, it will have very clear terms of reference. Uh, these are have tremendous variety in what these grants uh, could be used for, so it would have different terms, but a very clear 
objectives that mu what must be accomplished with those grants and a reporting structure back to the department to make sure uh, that that was accomplished. So um, that's that's how uh, the process works for uh, the, this uh, large public land area the department's responsible for. So the minister uh, it, it stated that there are terms of reference. Uh, will those will those be made public? How will the people of Alberta know that they're getting the value for the money from from these grants that have been given out? I, I'm not in a position where I can speak to each grant agreement, obviously, during estimates, Mr. Chair. So you know, I think we've given the honourable member a lot of latitude to try to get well into policy. And so at this point, I'd encourage him to get back to talking about the estimates that we're here to present. Um, but I will quickly just check if uh, the ADM of Public Lands wants to answer that question. But uh, you know, my view, Mr. Chair, is we should get back to talking about the budget. Yeah, a lot of the, uh... Sorry. Yeah, the, a lot of the uh, the details are available. We can uh, work with people to make sure that there's a good understanding. We have different agreements with different groups, and like I said, I think the the the, the future of this is that as we move towards the uh, 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 implementing and standing up a full uh, recreation management system, we're working on a system that will enable uh, some of this to be done through plans, so that it'll be clear about what's going to be achieved. It'll be clear where the priorities are. It'll be clear um, you know what things were considered so it is really part of the of the system that we're we're enabling so thank thank you very much for that and I, I appreciate that the department is working on a plan to better allocate these funds in the future when does the department expect to complete that work Yeah, the point of order is under Standing Order 23C. The member persists in needless repetition. Mr. Chair, the committee has convened for the purpose of considering the ministry's estimates. The matter has been previously raised already, and we do not need to hear it again, as it will unnecessary repetition, Mr. Chair. The question has been answered, and although the response did not meet the satisfaction of the member, the repetition of the question would mean a similar answer, which would waste the time of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Would, uh, Member Gallick? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. This is not only a point of order, but it's ridiculous to allege that it's a point of order. Uh, the member was asking questions, questions about money in the budget. The grants come out of the budget. We've identified the line items out of which the grants come. The budget comes not only with dollars, but also with a business plan. And in that business plan are metrics that the government identifies to determine how money is spent, because it's public money, and to hold people accountable. So we have the minister telling us that he gives out grants. He listed organizations to whom he gives the grants. But now we aren't told how those organizations are selected, what the criteria is, um, how it's measured, whether that money is actually doing anything. So, I mean, I think whether the member likes our line of questioning or not, it is a line of questioning which is clearly and transparently tied to the budget. Uh, we have identified the line item under which it has come, and we are permitted to continue asking the question until such time as some sort of answer is actually provided. And it will be clear in time that someone thought about something at some point, which is the answer we're getting right now, is not an answer. Hey, thank you, Member. I'm prepared to rule on this uh, needless repetition. That you, uh, as I've said in uh, many of the other uh, committee estimates that we've been through in the last two weeks, it is the opposition member's time uh, if he chooses to use it all up on one line of questioning and burn up a whole hour that's his prerogative the uh, minister and staff are under no abs absolute obligation to answer I, I was you know looking forward to hearing about uh, the minister's horse tank because we haven't heard that for for a while yet um, but yeah it is it is the member's time if they choose to use that and I th thank you mr. Makowicki for for taking a, a point and standing up there but uh, you know, we, we talk about transparency and, and the, the issue that I think the member is trying to get at. I, I believe the, the minister m mentioned the names of different groups that got the grants. That's on the public record. That's as transparent as you can get. I, I think if uh, the member wants to continue on this 
line of questioning for the remaining 25 minutes of his time, uh, so be it. So I, I don't think it's a point of order. Um, it's the member's time. So we'll, we'll carry on. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for that uh, uh, ruling and uh, completely agree with you. We are, uh, um, I think maybe some of the struggles that the Honourable Member is having is uh, understanding um, the management of uh, large areas uh, of, of, of our province where recreation takes place. Um, these are areas where they're done through, often through joint planning uh, groups that include uh, environmental organizations, uh, municipalities, First Nation communities, and others that are operating on the landscape. So we'll go to my neck of the woods. I know uh, the Honourable Member doesn't spend a lot of time west of Rocky Mountain House. But you have the Bighorn Standing Committee, which has existed for uh, many, many years, uh, which has helped uh, is a partner with the department to try to figure out the best way to invest resources in managing uh, recreation and the landscape uh, in that area. The Bighorn Standing Committee is made up of uh, communities like Rocky Mountain House, Clearwater County, uh, First Nation communities like the Ochis and um, um, the Bighorn, uh, as well as Sunchild and the Small Boys Camp in the area interact with that committee on a regular basis. Uh, basis. Communities like Nordegg, of course, who are right in uh, the center of some of the most beautiful landscapes on earth are at that committee, as well as public land officials uh, and provincial park officials. And they're working together to identify needs on, um, on a landscape that is very big. The Department of Environment is responsible for, I believe, about 60 percent of the entire land mass of the province. Um, and I, if I have that right, I think it's a little bigger than Great Britain, the entire land mass that they are responsible with managing. And obviously, the, uh, the department Thank really you, works hard. No, this is a high priority question, so well, uh, I, I want, I'm happy to answer. The department Mr. works Mr. very hard with those organizations to be able to determine where those needs are. Uh, and then uh, goes to the best partner uh, to be able to maintain uh, or to be able to utilize a grant. So for example, if you're going to groom snowmobile trails and there's going to be a process for that, you're obviously not gonna go to the hiking association, you're gonna work with the Alberta Snowmobile Association and other local clubs that are on the ground. But when we're refixing a trail inside Kananaskis, you're more likely you're going to go to the hiking association and not to the snowmobile association to be able to maintain that. But the reality is this, very clearly, the Kananaskis Conservation Pass is required through Treasury Board processes to be dedicated revenue and reinvested back into the park. And we are investing in the department significantly more than the $15 million that is anticipated to come in from the Kananaskis Conservation Packs back into Kananaskis. Thank you. On page 95 of the estimates, line 8 uh, is a trail permit fee. Now, it mentions revenue collected from off-highway vehicles. Uh, can the minister confirm for the committee uh, whether or not an off-highway vehicle trail fee is proposed to be charged this year? So in our uh, platform, Mr. Chair, as you know, we uh, committed to bringing in uh, both random camping and off-highway vehicle fees. Uh, this was a direct response to the former government's attempt to shut down large areas of the eastern slopes uh, to Albertans that utilize it for recreation purposes. Uh, last year, we uh, brought in the random camping fee, which is operated uh, for this year, as the Honourable Member knows. Uh, and this refers to uh, $4.5 million, I believe, yep, uh, that would come from uh, off-highway vehicle fees, uh, which is collected uh, currently through registrations on off-highway vehicle fees. Um, as you know, Mr. Chair, uh, your, your ATVs on the farm, and I don't know, Mr. Chair, whether you plow the driveway the same way that I do. I know we have a similar type of location where we go home. Um, we don't have to have uh, registration fees when we're on that, uh, on our own private property. But when you go out onto the eastern slopes, for example, in areas where you could ATV or other areas in the province, you are required to have a registration fee. Uh, and we've worked with Treasury Board and Finance to repurpose uh, that fee back into our budget. Uh, to be able to uh, fulfill our platform commitment of making sure that off-highway vehicle fees are going towards uh, conservation purposes and the protection of landscape as well as the maintenance of trails. Um, and I should mention as well, there's a commitment in there to invest and, and partner with uh, volunteer search and rescue as well as continue to work with municipalities uh, that are helping us manage Her Majesty's Forest Reserve. Uh, so, so how much of the $4.5 million on page 95 will come from the off-highway vehicle registration uh, that... So the random camping fee is also in that 4.5. Um, I'll see if uh, our officials can give you the breakdown. So of the 4.5, 
Uh, 1.5 million of that is coming from Randy Camping, uh, and the remainder is coming from uh, the ATV registrations. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I want to turn now to some questions around the, the Mine Financial Security Program, which I think is related to outcome two on page 43 of the business plan, uh, and, and also talk a little bit about how the department will respond to the Coal Policy Committee report. Now, the Coal <coughs> Policy Committee report identified some problems with the current structure of the Mine Financial Security Plan. Estimated liabilities exceed the assets. Assets may be overstated. Only two coal mines have had detailed audits performed. What work does Alberta Environment and Parks have planned for implementing the committee's recommendation that a mine reclamation funding plan be designed specifically for coal mines? While well, officials are... Uh Pulling on the mine security report, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll also elaborate a little bit of what the department will be doing to implement uh, Energy's recommendations uh, and their work that they're doing to, frankly, plug uh, the NDP's loophole to be able to mine things like uh, Category 2 lands. Uh, that was established by a written letter by uh, their energy minister, Mr. Chair. Uh, this will uh, is a clear recommendation from uh, the Coal Committee, but uh, as well now from the Department of Energy, uh, which has been supported by Cabinet. And Alberta Environment Parks will be working to enshrine uh, the 1976 coal policy inside the Eastern Slopes policy uh, as a temporary stop measure to make sure uh, that uh, we can uh, put in place the 1976 coal policy into land use planning. Uh, and we'll continue through uh, the process of implementing um, the 1976 coal policy into land use planning, again, to make sure that uh, in the future we won't see stuff like the Honourable Member's Government uh, trying to, through letter, change uh, the way that uh, coal mines could get built in the eastern slopes. Um, as for the mine security program, uh, we're reviewing the program to ensure appropriate funds are collected for mine operators uh, to cover both coal and oil sands mine reclamation liabilities. The review is focused on uh, program asset calculations, information reporting and timing of security payments and is targeted for completion by the end of 2022. Uh, my department remains engaged and is actively sharing information with mine operators and indigenous communities and organizations in order to ensure that this review is successful. Um, we'll keep working uh, towards that. Uh, and it had already started prior to uh, the, the coal committee's report. Um, there has been uh, conversations, uh, in my understanding, some auditor general reports over time as well on that issue. And we look forward to having more to say over the coming year on that important issue. Thank, thank you, Minister, for that explanation. Now. Uh, according to the most recent statement from the Alberta Energy Regulator, total mine reclamation liabilities increased by $2 billion last year, but the amount held by the Mine Financial Security Program only went up by uh, $40 million, which is approximately 2% of the liability increase. Uh, I, I'm wondering if the Minister can inform the Committee how much money to the Mine Financial Security Program was foregone due to the changes that were made to the program for oil sands producers last year? Um, just one second, actually, if we could. Um, we, we certainly don't have the details of that here, and I don't believe that's in Alberta Environment Park's budget, but uh, we will uh, endeavour to look into that uh, and get back to the member. Th th thank you. And, and, and certainly, it, I, I appreciate that the money that doesn't show up on Alberta Environment's budget, but the policy around the Mine Financial Security Program, how much money is collected, from whom, that is clearly the, the Ministry of Environment's responsibility, and I would hope that Having undergone some changes to the MFSP last year, there was some kind of analysis on how much revenue was going to be uh, uh, lost or, 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 or changed. Uh, so if, if the minister could commit to tabling that uh, analysis for the committee. Mr. Chair, what I'll commit to is, uh, as I said in my remarks on this, the department is reviewing it and is going to have lots to say both publicly and with stakeholders over the next year. We anticipate that review to be completed in 2022. Um, and while he is correct that there is a policy role for Alberta Environment Parks on this issue, which I'm happy to discuss, the exact financial details I'm not, I, I actually don't think are within Alberta Environment Parks estimates. Uh, and I'll just remind the committee we're here to talk about those estimates. Uh, 
Thank, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I, I have a few qu more questions now on the Coal Committee report and how the Environment and Parks Ministry is going to respond to that. So another one of the recommendations is reestablishing funding for the reclamation of legacy coal mines. I'm wondering what work the department will do this year to address these legacy coal mine liabilities. Uh, if there's an estimate of how much the legacy coal mine liabilities will cost the people of Alberta and whether or not that shows up in the budget here of Alberta Environment and Parks or will be carried under the uh, AER or, or where that will show up. My understanding is that would be underneath the Alberta Energy Regulator, uh, which would be tied to the Ministry of Energy's uh, budget. So in, in terms of uh, developing policies, though, for the reclamation of legacy coal mines, what role will Alberta Environment and Parks play in uh, reviewing those policies and coming up with recommendations to address these legacy coal mines? Both uh, the Ministry of Energy and the Department of Environment will work together in partnership uh, through that process, uh, and then ultimately we would provide um, directives and uh, policy to the Alberta Energy Regulator, who would be the one to implement that. And and is there a timeline that the department has for coming up with this direction to the Alberta Energy Regulator? I, yeah, I, I think what my answer to that, Mr. Chair, would be is that it's ongoing. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Now, the first recommendation in the coal policies report is that regional and sub-regional plans for, uh, area, uh, for the eastern slopes must be completed before any major coal approvals will be considered. So I'm wondering, how much money has been budgeted from Environment and Parks this year to complete these regional and sub-regional plans in the Eastern Slopes to implement this recommendation? And when will that work be completed? So, Mr. Chair, as you know, uh, sub-regional and regional plans take time. I want to thank you, Mr. Chair, for your work on uh, some of the most recent sub-regional plans that have just been completed around Caribou. Uh, and there is, uh, you know, the reality is that work must be done right. Uh, it has to involve significant consultation uh, and is going to take uh, several years to be able to complete all uh, across uh, the, uh, the province. Again, to my earlier remarks, which is why Alberta Environment will move forward with putting the 1976 coal policy into the eastern slopes policy for the time being to make sure that uh, the categories are enshrined uh, into land use rules that are currently in place in the department. And then as each regional plan and sub-regional plan is completed, if that plan overlaps with the eastern slopes, uh, the 1976 coal policy will become part of that. Uh, the reality of the legislation that is in place when it comes to land use planning is you can't just open up land use plans for one issue. You have to uh, complete all of the issues that are associated with land use planning. Uh, and so this is the most efficient way to do that while making sure that the eastern slopes are protected and the overall objective of the energy department when it comes to coal uh, is maintained. Um, if there's specifics about where that is, land use planning is funded uh, inside uh, the estimates, I'm happy uh, to talk about that. Uh, but uh, again, there's a lot of work taking place right now on uh, sub-regional processes, particularly around Caribou right now, where a large focus of the department uh, right now is on managing that issue for the province uh, because of the catastrophic, potential catastrophic outcomes uh, for communities like yours, Mr. Chair. And again, I'll thank you for all your hard work on that. Uh, thank you. So. Uh I, I noticed that on page 91 of the government estimates that the land use secretariat, which I understand is the primary uh, section of the department that's responsible for developing regional plans, uh, isn't getting an increase in, in the budget. So um, uh, can, can, can the minister inform the committee how, uh, uh, how he expects the, the government to complete this eastern slopes policy, continue work on the caribou sub-regional plans with no I additional investment in, in, those, uh, it, it, in the people who are doing that work? Well, Mr. Chair, I'm, I think the member's math's off. Uh, what was spent in 2020-21 on the land use secretary was one point, just over $1.4 million, uh, and the estimate for this year would be $5.1 million. So uh, that seems like a significant uh, increase. Um, the Coal Policy Committee report that, uh, recommended that uh, coal projects be subject to a net benefit test, implying that changes to the assessment of these projects is needed. I'm wondering what work will Alberta Environment and Parks do to implement this recommendation? Our friends in energy would be uh, responsible for uh, that conversation through the Alberta Energy Regulator, and I'd encourage you to ask Mr. Savage for more details on that. 
So, so Alberta Environment and Parks will not play any role in how coal mines are environmentally assessed? The uh, net benefit analysis that you refer to would be primarily led by energy. Of course, we would support energy as we always do. Uh, but if you're looking for it from a, a conversation of a budget perspective, again, we're here to talk about the budget, uh, I would uh, take it, uh, have a conversation with the Department of Energy on the details of how they intend to handle that within their budget. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, another thing that the Coal Policy Committee identified was a lack of trust <laughs> in regulatory entities in Alberta as a major issue. I'm wondering what work will Alberta Environment and Parks do this year to attempt to restore trust with the people of Alberta? Well, well some of the biggest things we've had to do right away, Mr. Chair, I know you know this three years ago, uh, when Minister Savage and I both became the Environment Minister and the Energy Minister, we, uh, the first challenge we had to face was probably the worst ethical disaster in the history of the Alberta government uh, that was overseen by the NDP government where for the very first time every officer of the legislature except for the child and youth advocate had a, a, a damning ethics report uh, into what the NDP did with the, uh, with the regulator. Uh, and so the very first thing we had to do to restore trust uh, was to uh, rebuild the entire Alberta Energy Regulator, its management staff, uh, its board, uh, to be able to establish uh, a regulator that could be trusted by Albertans uh, and clean up, frankly, that ethical disaster that was created by the NDP, and I'm proud to report that work ha has been done. Um, if the member has specifics about, again, the financial investments that take place inside the Alberta Energy Regulator, I would refer them to the Department of Energy's estimates because that's where it is financed. I, I appreciate the Minister's attempt to put this all on the Alberta Energy Regulator, but uh, uh, the, the Coal Policy Committee was much broader than just identifying trust with the Alberta Energy Regulator. And certainly Environment and Parks is an important regulatory ministry. What work will be conducted under Environment and Parks to restore trust with the people of Alberta? We uh, continue to uh, educate uh, the public about the important uh, work that takes place in Alberta Environment and Parks when it comes uh, to the regulatory role that we play. And Mr. Chair, I refer you to the, Alberta, the joint panel decision on uh, Grassy Mountain, uh, which refers to in detail uh, the strong environmental policies that exist in Alberta Environment and Parks as the reason for their decisions not to proceed with that mine, including work, uh, work and policies around uh, species at risk, uh, in particular West Slope cutthroat, uh, as well as um, fish and wildlife regulations that exist, our strong water policies that exist, all were referred to by that regulatory process uh, is why that mine uh, could not uh, proceed. Uh, and so we'll continue to uh, make sure that those strong regulatory rules remain in place uh, to be able to uh, protect uh, the environment uh, going uh, forward. Uh, the biggest thing that uh, has to take place is uh, to continue to provide assurances that that arm's length regulatory process that we have in Alberta remains arm's length. It's unfortunate to have watched at times the official opposition try to go past that arm's length process. I will say to you, Mr. Chair, that is how we ended up in a spot where you have the Ethics Commissioner, the Auditor General, the Ombudsman, and the Privacy Commissioner, both writing some of the toughest ethics reports I'd ever seen uh, in my time uh, in elected life against the then NDP government because of their attempts to be able to interfere with the regulatory process. The strongest thing that we can do to continue to make sure Albertans are feeling comfortable with the regulatory process is to assure them uh, that there will not be political interference in our regulatory process. And again, it's unfortunate to see the official opposition continuing uh, at times to push to see political interference in the regulatory process. Um, again, though, Mr. Chair, if there's a specific question uh, about our estimates or where we're going to invest on these regulatory issues, I am happy to answer them. But the Alberta Energy Regulator itself is financed through the Department of Energy. the business plan and the budget papers that we have in front of us and uh, there's plenty of uh, material there to ask questions on so I'd encourage them to do that. You have about six minutes left. Well, uh, I appreciate Mr. Chair that perhaps we have different interpretations of what's in the business plan and what isn't. Um, I want to, the final, the final recommendation from the Coal Committee report was to enhance environmental monitoring, inspection and enforcement at existing and abandoned mines to address water contamination and specifically selenium contamination within watersheds. How do you anticipate to meet this uh, recommendation from the committee while 
forecasting a 10% cut to the environment science and monitoring budgets in the 23, 24, and 24, 25 out years. I need these just well, Mr. Chair, uh, on this recommendation, Alberta Environment Parks already does it, and so we're good. To see, it was great to see the committee reaffirm that this is the right process. Um, in a moment, I'll get a list of the monitoring stations that are already take place, uh, particularly within the South Saskatchewan River and elsewhere. But also, in addition to that, over the past year, uh, my department's launched initiatives as part of its effort to continue uh, to work on this issue. A selenium management review to examine Alberta's current regulatory requirements and assess relevant policy tools used uh, in comparable jurisdictions. That's taking place as we speak. New surface water quality framework management frameworks, again, for the North Saskatchewan, the Battle, and the Upper Athabasca Rivers to protect water quality and manage cumulative effects. As well as already previously spoken about, a review of the Mine Financial Security Program to ensure it adequately covers the industry's reclamation liabilities uh, and protects taxpayer. But Alberta already has a very, very strong uh, process for water quality monitoring in our province, uh, with 116 active provincial monitoring stations all across the province, plus 31 additional tributary monitoring stations as part of the part of the oil sands monitoring program. These stations are intended, Mr. Chair, to capture the cumulative effects of multiple stressors in the watershed on river quality sites. There are also long-term river networks uh, that consist of 36 sites that are sampled monthly. 102 core water quality parameters are routinely measured at those sites and, and at 71 other tributary monitoring networks across the province, uh, which also, wow, uh, those, those monitoring networks consist of 80 provincial and 30 uh, oil sands monitoring sites, 31, I should say, Mr. Chair, oil sands monitoring sites that are sampled monthly. Uh, uh, in near and, and some in near real time, um, so uh, there are there was an identification by my department uh, about a year ago uh, about the need to uh, expand that water quality uh, management frameworks and monitoring into places like the North Saskatchewan and the Battle River. But as you can see, there's already a very significant amount of water quality monitoring that takes place all across the province, and will continue to. Um, and so, specifically to the coal report on that. I'm happy to report we already do that and we're going to continue to do it. So, so is it, 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 am I understanding the minister correctly in that he believes that the work is adequate and that the coal committee, uh, coal committee's recommendation is, is off base, that no additional monitoring or improvements to the monitoring programs is, is required? Well, again, Mr. Chair, I just listed to you some very adequate monitoring, but in addition to that, I actually opened up with recognizing that we don't think it's fully adequate which is why even prior to the coal report, under my leadership in the Department of Environment, we've added more uh, water quality uh, management framework processes. We're doing a selenium review as we speak, uh, in particular work around the North Saskatchewan and the Battle River uh, water or uh, river uh, corridors, which we have identified uh, needs to be uh, handled the same as elsewhere in the province. So no, I did not say that it was adequate. What I did say is that we have a significant amount of water quality monitoring taking place. Um, and, um, um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. The, the minister announced last year a selenium review. When will the people of Alberta be able to see the results, the outcome of that work? Yes, so, Mr. Uh, or Mr. Chair, though, uh, there's also some uh, draft federal regulations that are also anticipated uh, in late 2022 that have to deal with this issue, so there will be some overlap between my department and the federal department, uh, and we are working towards final publication of that process by 2023. By 2023, okay. And, and well, so is that just the selenium part, or, uh, uh, I mean, the minister mentioned the North Saskatchewan water quality framework, a, a Battle River quali or water quality framework. When, when will those be completed? So the selenium review process uh, was what I was referring to in 2023. Mm -hmm. uh, as for water quality frameworks, uh, they will be sooner than that. I don't have a date yet, though, um, but I anticipate that it would be um, in this year, I believe. Yeah. Okay. So in 2022 is uh, what we're tracking on that. Okay. Thank, uh, thank you very much for that. Now, uh, I don't have a whole lot of time. Uh, Uh, 
uh, can the, oh, line 7.5 in capital grants, is, is it, can the minister confirm for me that the $3.1 million, is that for Big Island Provincial Park? On page 92 of the estimates, line 7.5, Parks Infrastructure Management uh, Capital Grants, is that for Big Island Provincial Park? Yes. Okay, uh, why wasn't the $1.4 million uh, budgeted last year spent? Uh, because we had to renegotiate road access to be able to get into that area, uh, which has uh, prolonged our movement towards uh, Big Island Provincial Park, but we remain committed to it and anticipate that it will be completed this much, term. Minister, that concludes the first portion of the questions from the official opposition. We'll now move on to uh, the independent member for 20 minutes of questions. Would you like to combine your time with the minister? Yeah, back and forth. Are you amenable to that, minister? Thank sure. you. Go ahead, member. Okay, thank you very much, Minister, and thank you to your staff for being here today to appreciate the work that you do. Obviously, uh, environment and parks is something that's uh, near and dear to my heart, and uh, I know, uh, Minister, you probably agree that we don't get enough time in the outdoors, and uh, so we look forward to days ahead where we can spend more time and uh, enjoying the things we enjoy to do in our, in our free time, spending time in the outdoors. Uh, just going to start on uh, business plans, page 44, key objectives, 3.2. Uh, it says enhance angling and hunting opportunities through effective fish and wildlife man program management. And I guess I want to focus on the fish and wildlife program management. And in, in particular, uh, right now, I, th I think there's, a, there's been an initiative from your ministry, and I want to, I guess, uh, congratulate you on that. Uh, I've, I've heard uh, discussions that you've had uh, and where I was present at uh, public events. They're talking about the looking for a more natural and balanced age structure, in particular with mule deer, but uh, but again with all wildlife. So I just wanted to give you a chance to to talk about that a little bit and, and your feelings and what direction uh, the government has when it comes to uh, mule deer management, but maybe other species too, in, in regards to creating that uh, natural and balanced age structure. Well, I think uh, you're primarily honourable member referring to chronic waste disease uh, management techniques associated with mule deer, particularly in southeastern Alberta, I think is probably at the heart of your question. Um, you are correct that uh, the department has, uh, like other departments all across North America, a challenge with CWD. Uh, we continue to see it move further and further west, as you are aware. Uh, but at the same time, I, I have recognized that it, there have been techniques used primarily around uh, calls in the, in the past by the department to manage it, sometimes the level of frankly, shooting a lot of deer from helicopters. Uh, and we still remain in the same spot all these years later. Uh, and my view is that we are in a spot where, where as long as Saskatchewan is not prepared to be uh, in the same spot from a management technique as us, that we are trying to uh, plug a hole that we can't plug. Uh, and instead, we have started to move forward to encourage the department to work on CWD in different ways. Uh, and part of that would include uh, instead looking at the mule deer herd uh, for age structure instead of straight management of uh, size, which is something we've heard loud and clear from both hunters, outfitters uh, inside of that region, uh, and instead pivot to actually looking at ways that we can actually um, combat CWD as it moves west. And you and I have spoken lots about this. Part Some of that work is the joint work we're doing with Saskatchewan uh, and the Alberta Conservation Association on a potential vaccine. Uh, in addition to that, a uh, push to see the regulations at least have an education component about the main reason that we would see CWD move across the province, which is actually carcass control. Uh, and that is the, that's the number one way that we've seen it in the past. So um, it's, it's early days, but it's clear that continuing to do the same thing over and over for CWD has not worked. And we have to have a conversation with the department as well as with the Alberta Conservation Association, APOS, the Alberta Fish and Game Association and other key partners uh, in having a more, uh, I would say, modern way of trying to address CWD. Okay, thank you very much, Minister. Appreciate those comments. Uh, uh, kind of along the same uh, vein here uh, when it comes to uh, uh, wildlife management, uh, the Minister's licenses, of course, I, I see that as an opportunity to increase tourism and showcase the management of our wildlife around the world and, of course, bring money in for projects to do with wildlife management. And uh, I, know, I know there's been some, uh, some recommended changes or some suggestions there might be some changes coming there too. And I just wanted to, to give you again an opportunity to kind of expand on that a little bit. And, uh, and because I, I, like I say, I believe that's, that's been important. And as our wildlife management 
improves, then I think that, that helps showcase uh, not only the, the tourism opportunities in Alberta, but also the, uh, to show other jurisdictions how good wildlife management can make a difference for the, the societies of, as a whole. Yeah, thanks for that question, honorable member. It's uh, uh, the ministerial tags, which have been in place for a while. I believe it actually started underneath the former MLA for Rimby Rocky Mountain House Sundry when he was Mr. Mr. Lund. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to report, I don't know if you saw, that we've seen the first increase in a long time at the uh, Sheep Show in Reno this year for Alberta's tag. Certainly nowhere near the record yet. We've got more work to do on that. But uh, I announced the other day uh, at our Wild Sheep Show um, that we would be adding uh, antelope, Merriam's turkey, as well as antlered moose, particularly in the south uh, western portion of the province, which you know is a unique antlered moose opportunity that we have in Alberta that probably has not uh, been given uh, adequate uh, attention. And hopefully that, that this will do it. We'll continue to use those, uh, those tags to, one, give Albertans a unique opportunity. I mean, often we only talk about it from the auction side, but we, as you know, that also comes with a draw opportunity for, for Albertans to get a very unique opportunity, Alberta hunters. Uh, and so we'll, we're we going to continue to do that uh, because we see it as a way forward uh, to really help with conservation, particularly on some of our more unique species, bighorn sheep, obviously, but antelope uh, and shires moose uh, being one of them. Okay, thank you very much, Minister. Appreciate that. Uh, I'm just going to switch over now to land and uh, land management. Uh, you're, you're aware, I'm sure, the, and because we've talked about it and had discussions on it, uh, the, the, Fox, the town of Fox Creek wanting to purchase land and that process took, I'm not sure exactly, but seven, eight, maybe even nine years and that, of course, that goes through three governments, so obviously it's not, uh, you know, all on you and, and your government on that. So, uh, so I just wanted to, to bring that up but also talk about the, the industrial gateway that MDA Greenview is working with. That process is a, a few years underway but I believe that's coming closed or maybe has finished too, if I could get a bit of an update on that. I know both of these projects, the, you know, the, the Industrial Gateway, that time period, uh, and, and I understand it does take some time to do this process, it's not something that's just done immediately, but that investment has lost billions of dollars of uh, possible investment, and, and the Fox Creek land transfer, that, that cost uh, the community millions of dollars of investment there too. So I, I guess I, I know you've been working on trying to shorten up that time frame and everything, and I just want to know basically how long, and, and I understand not every project's the same and not every sale's the same, but roughly how long would it take now for a municipality to purchase land from the government now to go through that process. And again, I know that's not a, you can't have a set number on that, but, but if, if, if you could uh, just give us an idea if that timeline's been shortened and that process uh, streamlined a little bit. So I would answer this question both with grazing uh, and leases timeline as well as purchases. Uh, and we have certainly with the advent of bringing in the DRAS, have been able to speed up the grazing and lease side of it significantly. I mean, under the former government, I think a grazing and lease transfer was sometimes between three and seven years, and now we, we have that well underneath uh, a year as we should. Um, we are we're moving forward uh, rapidly on the dedicated industrial zone in the heartland down here, which we see that pilot as the opportunity to be able to then be used in places uh, like the, the uh, Green Line, right? Uh, uh, Greenview, sorry, and uh, yeah, we're not going to Greenland. That'd be a muskox hunt there, uh, honorable member. But um, it, you know, being able to be replicated up there, another area that is uh, commonly talked about right now would be Medicine Hat. Um, we are going to see the pilot uh, advance significantly this year, which we think long term will help uh, with uh, with industrial zones like you, that your community is pushing for. Uh, there are multiple ministries and in, 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 part of that process that takes time, multiple regulators as well. Um, so I wish I could say it was easy, but it's, it's actually a challenge. But I think if we successfully do that in the heartland, we'll be able to uh, copy it elsewhere. Um, I, I'm glad you brought up land sales. We, you know, we need to protect the landscape, uh, make sure that we're uh, keeping Albertans land there for recreational opportunities. I know your and Habitat, which I know you're very passionate about. We also need to recognize that Frankly, the, the Land Stewardship Fund uh, in Alberta, my department, uh, is primarily funded through land sales uh, where, and it was built off of a concept where there is land that is owned by the Crown that would be better used for agriculture or for municipal purposes. Um, but the, re the, the process of that is the, the proceeds from that sales go into Land Stewardship Fund to then go buy habitat and more sensitive environmental landscapes. So <clears throat> part of the issue that we faced on this, uh, Honourable Member, is to... Uh, educate people on how we actually accomplish stuff like 
uh, you know, the land, we awarded $89 million in funding to nine, nine land trust organizations between 2011 and 2012, for example, um, which conserved 172,000 acres of prime habitat or environmental landscapes. We would not be able to do that if we weren't moving some land out of our portfolio that would be better suited for agriculture or forestry purposes. So, but to answer the core of your question, the land sale process, part of the issue is um, speeding up stuff like surveys and some of the complications with other departments. Uh, and uh, we are not as far along with that as we are with the grazing lease side because that's where we chose to go first. But I anticipate the department will head there next. Okay, and thank you very much, uh, very much for that. I appreciate uh, bringing up the land trust uh, uh, information there too. I think that's uh, great to see that happening too. I uh, just want to go uh, on to a different topic again now uh, with uh, page 92 and estimates, uh, 10.2, the tier program and expenses there. Now, I, I guess I'm curious as uh, how much uh, of that money is being uh, spent on uh, subsidies for solar and how that compares to what the previous government was doing. And again, I'm presuming that's coming out of the tier fund there too, and I'm not certain. So just uh, there, there could be some concerns on, on how much money has been spent on incentives versus, uh, you know, just straight uh, incentives and subsidies versus straight uh, emissions reduction. So, so uh, under the previous government, there would have been uh, amounts that were spent on the subsidization of solar. And in our first year uh, in government, uh, there would have been some overlap of funding commitments. But in this budget, there would be very minimal subsidies for solar, if not none. Uh, with the caveat that the offset credit market itself may create um, some subsidies, but that are not being paid for by taxpayers, just the nature of offsets, uh, could create opportunities for uh, renewables. Uh, but th this budget itself is not investing inside uh, solar. Uh, and I think that, frankly, proves, uh, given that Alberta continues to be, uh, as far as I'm aware, the largest, if not uh, close to the largest uh, province with investment in renewables without subsidies coming from the government, uh, I think shows that our government's approach to this to create a regulatory environment uh, where uh, people can be innovative uh, makes more sense than uh, the previous government's attempts to subsidize uh, the industry. Okay, thank you. And, and uh, just kind of one last uh, question here, comment. Uh, uh, we, we do have the, the orphan well program with when it comes to oil and gas industry, and I just wondered, is there any uh, talk or discussion going on about uh, you know what might happen down the road with windmills that become less active and and maybe companies go bankrupt and and how that's that, that cleanup's going to happen and, and I guess say, likewise with solar. So there's a there's a, some pressure coming on the department to have a policy conversation about potentially creating a framework to put renewable projects on Crown land. Currently, there is nothing like that in the province of Alberta. Uh, I spoke about this at RMA the other day. My hesitancy to see the department go down that road uh, remains with not wanting to be in a spot where we create the next orphan well pro uh, problem on Crown land. On private land, we're dealing with a whole different legal structure than we are with oil and gas, as you know, because of uh, you know, subsurface processes. Um, but. You know, while we have indicated, particularly to the community around Swan Hills who wants to have this conversation, that we're willing to have a policy conversation about it, um, we, I will not uh, allow the department to move forward with that in a significant way unless uh, I think that there's a path forward where we can guarantee that we don't end up in a liability situation that we saw with oil and gas wells. And so um, it's, it's a live conversation, but the hesitancy of the department to go down that road uh, is to protect Crown land and in particular protect future taxpayers. Okay, thank you very much, Minister. That's all the questions I have for now, but if, uh, if you didn't mind, I'd maybe just have you cover some of the issues, especially when it comes to maybe the environment and uh, wildlife, if you want to take some time and, and discuss some of the objectives you have now, and maybe uh, uh, endangered species and how that, that uh, project's going with, uh, with the Endangered Species Committee and everything. So yeah. I'll leave the time to you now. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll probably talk about a couple things then if I could, uh, Mr. Chair, the, the, and I know the Honourable Member is passionate about most of them, so I'll try to stick to, to the ones that him and I share. Uh, first, I, I do want to recognize the, the Department and its work that uh, we did over COVID with the APOS, uh, with the Alberta Professional Officer Society. Uh, I think it was a unique opportunity for us to help uh, small businesses all across the province, of which I know you are also uh, have worked in that industry most of your life. Uh, and been able to uh, creatively work with uh, that process to be able to make sure 
uh, that outfitting survived inside our province. And I think that uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife deserves a tremendous amount of credit for that, and I certainly appreciate the work they did on that. Um, I know another issue that uh, probably is not being talked about enough on the fish and wildlife side is the work we've done on grizzly bears. Uh, over uh, the last uh, several years, we now have the largest grizzly bear DNA study anywhere in the world that I'm aware of uh, that has been completed uh, and shows uh, is going to be able to provide a significant amount of data uh, to the department to make determinations on how we manage the bear going forward, uh, which is exciting. And I think previous governments uh, were not willing to put that level of investment into that key species. Um, so uh, I'm excited that work has been completed. I think it's going to create uh, some opportunities uh, for us to uh, be able to overcome some of the areas of concern in communities like yours and mine uh, when it comes to the overall conversation about uh, the grizzly bear. Uh, I also think that uh, the government uh, should be very proud of the work, and I'm very proud of the department's work, uh, on when it comes to caribou. Uh, as you know, you come from that neck of the woods where there could have been significant consequences if we got this wrong. Um, Mr. Chair, I think the, some of the estimates on a, uh, on a SARA order in Northern Alberta would have resulted in about 75,000 jobs lost and maybe the end of the forestry industry inside Northern Alberta, something that was completely unacceptable. But it was also clear that we couldn't continue not to do anything when it came to caribou. And so I think one of the great successes of this government when it comes to species at risk was the task force process that we put in place. Uh, the chair of this committee has done two of them now. It's a big job, uh, or I think he's working on his second one, but I'm sure he'll be just as successful as his first. Uh, and that process of being able to bring the community together, Indigenous communities, environmental organizations, and industry uh, to overcome what is a real serious species challenge that we have across basically the entire northern portion of our, our province has seen significant success and shows that we can manage species at risk on the landscape while still having economic activity and making sure that we can protect our economic development in the province. So I think that stuff's been exciting. And then I know uh, uh, the Honourable Member doesn't like to fish as much as me. He likes to go hunting more than me. I do like to go hunting too, Mr. Chair. I won't deny that. But uh, I do like to fish a little more than the Honourable Member. And I think some of the work we've done, particularly on walleye, is pretty exciting. It's something that was called for a long time in opposition. I've been able to increase harvest opportunities in large portions of the province. Uh, playing uh, with you know, new regulatory techniques that can help make sure that species uh, can be utilized by Albertans but still be there for my kids and your kids uh, in, in the future. The largest investment hatcheries in decades uh, to be able to make sure that we can maintain recreational fishing opportunities, uh, which is really important given the speed of the growth of our population. And I know you and I both want to make sure that uh, kids, our kids and grandkids get to go enjoy the outdoors like we did. And this government has invested probably in that, uh, probably more uh, in that than in any government, in, I'd say 40 or 50 years. So there's some real neat stuff taking place on that. And I know that the chair, who's been very passionate about uh, this issue as well, um, is, you know, even stuff like cormorants, being able to play uh, with new ideas uh, to see how we can manage uh, to make fisheries sustainable and allow um, uh, species to interact inside those landscapes uh, in more, uh, more efficient ways has been kind of exciting. So there's a long way to go to be able to, you know, particularly when it comes to fish, Alberta's challenge uh, with uh, lack of water compared to other, uh, other jurisdictions. Uh, but there has been a lot of creativity that's been allowed to take place on fish and wildlife over the last couple of years. The other one I'll talk about, I don't know if you know this honorable member, but uh, we have some more turkeys on their way here. Uh, governments of the past have sat on the turkey management plan for a very long time. And I signed off on that just recently, and uh, we're bringing in more turkeys, Merriam turkeys, from uh, Manitoba to increase what is a really unique hunting opportunity uh, for Albertans and a high demand. I think it's one of the highest things tried to be drawn every year. Uh, and uh, we're working with the Alberta Conservation Association on conversations about a new species of turkey uh, coming into Alberta. So there's lots of exciting stuff happening, so much exciting stuff, I'm losing my voice. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, are there any other members wishing to speak? Uh, seeing none, then pursuant to Standing Order 59.01-8, the estimates of the Ministry of Environment and Parks are deemed to have been... Uh, no, it's okay. There's nobody asking questions, sir. The, the uh, estimates of the Ministry of Environment and Parks are deemed to have been considered for the time allotted in the schedule. This also concludes the consideration of the 2021-2022 main estimates by the Standing Committee on Resource Stewardship. Thank you, everyone. This meeting is adjourned. Sorry about that. I